Uh, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Bristol Old Vic. Um, we have a wonderful panel here for this discussion, Arts in a Time of Crisis. Um, Vanessa Kasule, the poet and playwright, give her a warm round of applause, please. Um, Alan Lane, actor, writer, director, and artistic director of Slung Low in Holbeck. Alan, have you written a book recently? <laughs> Alan Lane. Uh, Angie Bual, who is the creative director, is that the right title? And chief executive of Trigger, the company that put a dragon into the sky over Plymouth um, and are based in Somerset. Please welcome Angie Bual. And Shami Chakrabarti, eminent lawyer, and as of July this year, is that right? Or August. June? August. <laughs> Chair of the Gate Theatre in London, Shami Chakrabarti. <laughs> so the topic this evening is arts in a time of crisis. Um, quite quickly, we're going to get to a discussion up here and then I'll open it out to the floor. Um, but I've been asked to make a sort of provocation to begin with, which I will now attempt to do. Um, the topic, arts in a time of crisis, is weirdly resonant in this building um, and in the hands of this organization, I mean the Bristol Olvic Theatre Company, because this theatre is called the Bristol Old Vic because at a time of crisis, when the British economy was in enormous debt, the then government, this is in 1946, decided to experiment with the idea of subsidizing theatre outside London, which was then a very radical thing to do. Um, and they decided to do that, I'll say this again, at a point where there was massive national debt, because they believed that creativity and the arts were an absolutely vital part of the rebuilding of our society. And what they decided to do was to invite the Old Vic Theatre in London to send a company of actors to Bristol, which therefore became the Bristol Old Vic Company, performing in that theatre, which was then widely known as the Theatre Royal. So it was the Bristol Old Vic Company at the Theatre Royal. And if you like, the success of that experiment of subsidizing a theater outside London led to the development of what we now call the cultural infrastructure of this company. It led to subsidized theaters in every region. Other arts organizations in every region were being developed and invested in at the same time. And the idea was that there would be, if you like, a connected network of cultural opportunity, which would reach into every community in the country, which would provide whatever the arts could offer to those communities, and also offer an opportunity for the talented voices within those communities to progress in whatever their art form was. This theater was at the very start of that. And now, according to some, that infrastructure is in peril. At the same time, if you look around you now, if you listen to the conversations that are being had, there is a huge energy of reinvention in our industry, in theater, and also in other creative industries. There are people who, having gone through the traumas of the pandemic, are now impatient for the kinds of change which have long been overlooked in theatres, opera houses, concert halls, art galleries, and elsewhere. So we've got this weird combination of an infrastructure which has survived the pandemic. And I have to say, and this is surprising, it survived the pandemic to some degree because the government created the Cultural Recovery Fund 
and invested in the infrastructure. It was an imperfect investment, we all know that. Um, and it didn't look after the freelance artists who actually create the work that goes on in theatres like this. But it did ensure the survival of this organization and a great many other organizations like it. We have that therefore surviving infrastructure meeting a visionary reform from the Arts Council, which is about driving opportunities into communities and into the hands of people who have not hold, had those opportunities before. Um, if you don't know this, the Arts Council strategy is called Let's Create. And it's also being driven, as you know, and may feel more cynical about, I certainly do, by an agenda that we know is leveling up, um, which has instructed Arts Council in the last couple of weeks to move a huge amount of money from London into areas where there is disadvantage and underprovision in culture. All of these changes happening at once, all of these changes happening now, and our job this evening is to open out what the possibilities are, what the opportunities are within that ferment that we're in the middle of now. It is a rare, rare moment of change. Can we seize it? Can we take the positive? Can we overcome the negative? What you will find and what we find as we work in this industry running this theatre, I'm the outgoing artistic director, Nancy Medina, incoming artistic director, sitting there, Charlotte G's beside her, the joint chief executive and executive director. What we find is that we're constantly having to describe the benefit of what we do, in our case, the shows we make, the engagement programmes we put together, the talent development opportunities we put together, in terms of their contribution to the economy of this city and the country uh, in terms of the measurable, so, measurable social benefit they bring to the communities who they serve, in terms of the demonstrable talent pipeline they offer for artists, and in terms of their contribution to what is called now soft power, that means the international reputation of British creativity. All of these things we're now increasingly encouraged, encouraged to measure uh, and argue about and explain what we try and do in terms of those. But at the same time, what we all know is that the personal impact of an artwork on any one of us as individuals, actually whether we're making it or whether we're in an audience experiencing it, is completely missed out from all of these metrics and all of these arguments that are made. So just before we get into the conversation, I just want you all for a moment to close your eyes, really close your eyes, and remember an encounter that you've had with a work of art. Yes, at home, close your eyes as well. Remember an encounter that you've had with a work of art which you felt was precious. It might have been comforting, it might have been transformative, it might have been definitive in some way, it might have been challenging, whatever it was, give yourself a moment to remember your encounter with that work of art. and begin the journey of asking yourself whether you can define what it is that makes that memory precious for you. Can you put your finger on it? You don't need to tell anyone. But just think about it and see whether you can bear that in mind during this conversation. Okay, you can open your eyes again now. That's my bit done. Um, so now 
I'm going to start asking some questions of our panel. Um, and I want to start with a broad question, which is, what is there in this strange set of circumstances that we're in to be hopeful about? What is there that excites us about what might be achieved? And I'm very unfairly going to start with Angie on this question because she's, you're really on the threshold of your company's growth, aren't you? So would you like to talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, when you ask me what gives me hope, I think about the pandemic. And I think at one point right in the, in the middle of it, I really wondered whether places like lecture theatres would ever see people in the seats again and whether we could even take our masks down and whether it would divorce us from art and culture so much that we wouldn't want to find ourselves at home in somewhere like this. And as soon as those floodgates opened and we were able to be together at community, I don't know about anyone else, but I was going to shows that weren't necessarily the highest quality, but I was just so overcome by emotion about being in the same room and listening to the same thing and being on the same bandwidth as everyone else and that being a very important social glue. And I definitely have found it much, the, the work of the arts to be much more powerful um, and I think people are hungry to find, because we're in such a divided uh, world, we are, well, whether we're hungry or not to find it, I think it's more important than ever to find that social glue. And I think that's where culture can and does play a part. Brilliant. Thank you. Vanessa, do you want to have a go at that question from the freelance artist? Um, I'll try my best. I think we're all gonna have a really tough job divesting from the things that benefit us. I'm gonna assume because all of us are in this room that in some way we benefit from the system as is, even if we've got our own personal grievances or um, structural uh, grievances um, that might have affected us. Being in this room, certainly me being on this panel, being asked my opinion and paid to do so, um, I have benefited in many ways from the cultural system as it is. And looking at the changes that I think need to happen and the people that were excluded before and excluded even more so now, people like me are gonna to have to divest from certain things that I'm comfortable with, that work for me, um, that serve my individualism as an artist, because you know, I love to have my name in lights and I love to you know, be clapped at the end of a show. Um, but thinking about the things that matter in terms of art being a truly collective communal endeavor some of that shiny name in lights you know big name directors um you know big production show things you know those are the things i love um but you know i'm thinking more about you know how do we continue to make uh theater accessible people have talked about post pandemic all of the online things you know there was a, a sudden shrinking in that. Yes, some shows were still being offered online, but um, I've seen lots of laments from people who are um, disabled saying, you know, this was an amazing thing where I finally got to uh, engage with shows that I couldn't before. And because the pandemic is ostensibly over for some people, um, that's just been taken away. So I think it's about people like me who don't necessarily think about these things as much as I should. And that's me as an individual. I don't actually have the power of someone who actually makes decisions thinking, okay, you know, are we really about this? Are we willing to do things that mean that we're on the back foot and we're having to learn new processes and ways of being? Um, so for me, it's about that. It's about really thinking about change in the ways that mean that even you as someone who has a foothold in the space have to make adjustments. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Shami, you, you've just started really as the gate, the gate theatre's chair, um, and it's complex. I'm going to say this because it, it's part of the conversation. We can't ignore it. The gate is one of the theatres in London that's just been cut. Um, you might want to include that in what you say, but would you mind starting by talking about why you took on that role um, coming out of the pandemic? And then, and then take it wherever you like. Um, so, so in truth, um, when I was a kid in the 70s and the 80s, because I am that old, um, in a state school in 
North London, which is now a bad place where you're not allowed to be funded, right? <laughs> Um, um, trips to theatre and peripatetic music teachers were amazing to me. Life changing. Now, obviously, later, later, I studied law and I went into politics, but to be that person who could even go to that place, I had to start as a little person in. In, in Thatcherism, in difficult times, but getting the opportunities to go funded by the state, funded by the school, to go on the coach and go to the national, the royal court, wherever it was. Yes, I was in London. I was in London. But to be fair, my parents had been beaten up by skinheads of the national front, you know, Let's not do this London versus the world thing, please, okay? So that was the beginning of my journey. And, and for me, and, and I was never gonna be a great violinist, but my music education gave me literacy in music. And I never said opera's not for me or classical music's not for me or rap is not for me. I was included in a conversation and a culture that everybody should own all over the world. So I don't believe in divide and rule. And so I got the opportunity in this old age of mine to support a small radical theater that was in Notting Hill, was encouraged to come to Camden by an arts council that rightly said, you shouldn't be in a room above a pub where nobody can in a wheelchair, climb the stairs. You should come to this new community. And I just thought that was a great move, etc., etc. And enough said. Um, we weren't given total, total open disclosure. And then we're because we're North London. But I just say I live in a city of food banks next to investment banks, and a creative community. It's not London versus Bristol or London versus Durban or London versus anywhere. This is a truly global community. And I'm a lawyer, I'm an activist, I'm a political person. I am not, you are beautiful creative people. I was never talented enough, but I know the value. I know the value of stories told in music, in poetry, in theatre. And no government of whatever persuasion should control those stories and should decide your, com your community, your community leveling up. No, that is not, that's not arm's length. That is not the Secretary of State. That's the Secretary of State has instructed us. I'm not comfortable with that, but I will, I will live with that. And I will, I'm the sort of person who gets up and fights. Um, and not in a, hopefully not in a destructive way, but I want us to come together. And, you know, I was talking to friends tonight. Bristol, to me, reminds me of Manchester, reminds me of Glasgow. There are, I have spent, yes, I am a Londoner, but I'm not a sort of, being a Londoner is to be part of the world, not to be against the world. And I'm very depressed, people should say, that being a Londoner is to be anti-creative or anti-community or anti any of the things that we want to do. Thank you. Um, Alan, Yes. we're looking for optimism. Yes. I, I come from a place called Holbeck. So in case you don't know it, I want to tell you because it's where my optimism comes from. Holbeck is a ward in inner South Leeds uh, in Yorkshire where we keep the dragons. And um, it's the, the worst health outcome of any ward. And it, it's the, the, the bottom 2% on a number of poverty indices. And it is an amazing, fantastic place full of stories and magic. And, and, and the first thing I'm optimistic about is I left this morning and I've just, we're, me, me, me and the gang I'm in are opening a new theatre in a warehouse. And at the minute it's just a warehouse. Uh, and, and today there were 2,000 coats 
laid out because um, various people, the maddest mix of people from all different types of social background and all professional backgrounds decided that all the warm spaces that our city council are creating needed coats. So we've made a coat library. Now, obviously we go, what a world we live in that we need a coat library. But that is the world we live in. And until they make me emperor, I'm gonna do what I can. <laughs> And what I can <laughs> is offer them my floor so we can lay out the 2,000 coats. So uh, I had my local ward councillors come around this morning and they said, what are all these coats doing here? And I said, it's a coat library. And they said, what a thing. <laughs> and so that makes me uh, really, because during COVID, we opened a food bank and it was exactly the same thing. We understood, community was understood in a different way. The need for collaboration was understood in a real baked bean tin sort of a way and not a shall we make a play way, which is just as valid but is less muscular. The second thing I'm really excited about uh, looking out to the world is Zelensky has taught us the power of story. Uh, without that man, the finest storyteller of our generation, his, his um, country would currently be under Russian um, occupation and there is no denying that. Anybody who follows the military tactics of it, he held the ground for two and a half days and as a result, his country lives because of the power of his story. Mm. And I see that in Holbeck, I see that in, the, in my hill to die on, that the power of a story can make you walk, at, not to the top of a hill, it can't beat capitalism, it can't make the sick well, but it can put an extra spring in your step. And that is really exciting. And then the third thing is, which is partly trying to find some hope in all this chaos that the MPO thing has, has created is that we are going to live soon in a 20 minute town world. And if we don't, we won't be able to afford to go anywhere. So the idea that we would, this is an amazing theater and I mean no disrespect, but the idea that Leeds needs one theater in the middle of its city. Uh, and that's where all the money goes, even though there is no public transport that can possibly go from that theater to Holbeck. And there are no parking because obviously we don't believe in cars. What are we gonna do? I can fly. So, um, so we're gonna live in a 20 minute town. That is our future. And we either seize it now, or we don't. And that's why I don't understand the MPO thing, because the gate is a 20 minute town theatre. It doesn't matter whether it's in London or not. It's a 20 minute town theatre. Everyone can walk to it. It's that small. That's what its function is. And so that I get hopeful because it doesn't matter what the, uh, the people currently writing policy will do. Inevitably, inevitably, global warming mixed with some form of sensible capitalism will turn us into a 20 minute town and we will rediscover our neighbours. And I hope that it's in my lifetime, but I get really hopeful about that. Three hopeful things, Tom. Very good, thank you. Thanks. Can it be useful? Can you just talk a little bit more about the twenty-minute town model and what it is, just in case people yeah, like so me haven't idea, heard? You kind of need everything you you kind of need everything you need within twenty minutes walk, right? Because we don't want to drive into the city centre and park. I've just walked. I, I've, I've never been here. It's amazing. But I've just walked from the train station. And there's a bridge out, and there's some sort of chaos, and everyone was running around in circles, and it just doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. There isn't anywhere to park. Um, the buses are all chaos. I don't know whether it's the same here, but you've absolutely, we've got an opera company, a ballet company, a theater company in Leeds. It's amazing, what a privilege. And I live 30 minutes walk, I know, because I take the primary school there from all those things, but there are no buses. There are no buses after a show comes down. They all stop at seven, because that's when people stop shopping. So the buses just stop. So we have these things, but you've got to catch a cab. So we are literally creating a cultural life and all sorts of life just for the very wealthy. We need to live in communities where we, the things we need for our weekly life are within 20 minute walks. And a lot of planning, uh, uh, planning departments are forcing organizations to do that. So I've just recently created a theater and the people said, where are your audience gonna come from? Because if it's more than a 20 minute walk, you don't have enough parking. What a great question. But why would I want my audience to come from more than a 20 minute walk in the first place? If I'm not being Holbeck's theater, then whose theater am I being? That's a really weird state of affairs. So the idea, 20 minute town, uh, everything you need is within 20 minutes walk, you know, don't get me wrong, you're allowed to get on a train and visit other cities, but you should be able to find everything you want. Brilliant. Um, I also want to pick up on what you're saying about telling stories and Angie, to come back to you, because really your company, Trigger, grew from you going around and telling people the story of the dragon and what you wanted to do with it. Um, and also Trigger is set up as a public art company. It is not a company that puts shows on in, in theatre spaces. So can you talk a little bit about story in relation to your work, picking up from what Alan said? Yeah, so for anyone who uh, hasn't come across our work, which is probably a lot of people, um, we, we one of the projects I'm most proud of is a, um, a 
flying dragon the size of well 20 meters wingspans that's kind of bigger than the width of the space here and um, she was a puppet a bit frame structure a bit like warhorse kind of joey's structure and she turned into a kite in front of um, a city and she lived in plymouth for two days she hatched there she discovered it she's um, watched community members and, and really she was letting us all look at Plymouth and the activity in Plymouth and the street furniture and the messenger statue and the lighthouse with new eyes and um, she really brought a bit of magic to Plymouth and she's she, there's no crane or um, car that moves her along she's very very quiet as she as she ambles through so it was a bit like having an elephant you know or, or like when the, the whale came up the Thames it became that sort of urban legend um, and everybody knew over the weekends that we she was going to try and fly and she was going to fly over the cliff tops of Plymouth and she flew from Devon to Cornwall and that had never been done before and that really had my heart in my mouth <laughs> um, and it was a real it was really exciting as well because we were working with world kite champion flyers designers and puppeteers um, to try and create this new art form and the puppet had been created over two years in a industrial unit in Plymouth with the engineers in that unit helping our engineers figure it out so it really did feel and was made um, and designed in Plymouth with all of the people there and I just you know for, for projects like that it does turn your world upside down. It means that you do talk to the person next to you and um, people from all walks of life, 30,000 people came out for the flight and you had little ones, older ones, people of all, you know, all types. And the reason we chose the dragon was because she's from Eastern Western mythologies. And also um, there's a lot of interesting stuff around zoology of, of dragons and how we've come, how we've all come to, um, to have that ancient myth and legend in, in all of our st storytelling. Um, so it, it creates quite, a, I talked about social glue at the beginning, but that really is important to me. And, and I guess our second album, Pollinations, <laughs> which is on in, se in September, was something around my hunger to um, look at two difficult emotions that I was grappling with. One was when Colston statue came down and thrown into the river. I was really struck by the right wing stuff on Twitter about if you don't like these statues, then go home. And I found it a really long process to be able to answer someone when they say go home with a good answer because I wasn't taught about why India was um, colonized and why therefore people like me are here until very, very late in my life, like till embarrassingly recently, I'd say. And um, I was thinking, well, how do we tell stories about whose home this is? And at the same time, like with everyone else, probably I turned to nature over lockdown. I was growing in my garden and I realized that's something that everybody, mm. a lot of people were into. And um, conflating those two sort of feelings and emotions and interests um, found out with an ecologist that 80% of the plants in our British gardens are non-native. And that just blew my mind. So if you open your curtains and you're lucky enough to have a back garden, what you're seeing is multicultural and it's historically multicultural. So the English rose is from China <laughs> and the, the conquer tree is from Turkey. And so things that seem very, very old in your landscape and the beauty and the color and diversity in your gardens and the differences are, are what, what makes Britain beautiful and what makes our societies beautiful. And, that, and at that point, I think we can be very down on being British and it's so terrible and we're so bad and it's awful. And I genuinely think there's a lot to be proud of. And we have this incredible food culture and we are, we are where we are And this project. Was really <laughs> sorry, to, um, to celebrate that and not, not in a cynical way, not to hide the difficulty that it's taken to get here, but just to celebrate being multicultural. And so with that, we created um, and invited at City thousands of people to grow plants or collect and take our own plants and plant them into the middle of urban um, square in Birmingham in a project called Pollinations. There's a pun that perhaps it's hard to get, but it's called Poly Nations, many nations. Right. Um, and we transformed <laughs> um, this, this very concrete space and soon insects zoomed in and dragonflies zoomed in. There was a huge petition to keep the forest there and there were architectural trees that created this canopy with costume. And, but what it really did in Birmingham was 
it did pre bring people from all, all, all walks of life because you might tell people to be proud but until you're standing there and you've put something on in that space and you feel like you've built it and you've contributed to it and you have the power physically and literally to transform your space that agency I think is something that you can take away with you and you can think well bloody hell we went and did it we did it because it was a bit like a barn raising making that project happen and then at the end um 4, 000 plants were taken away and, and went back into the community and thousands of trees and plants have gone back into community centers and I hope that that's resonated with people they can be closer to nature in their urban environments and it's cool to be different brilliant I mean it's fantastic hearing you telling those stories now and the work is storytelling as well um, this is a question for you or anyone else I happen to know that it took four years of you telling the story of the dragon and being told no by various people who could have helped you and didn't um, before it actually was realized. And now, of course, it's being invited all over the world. Um, so I wonder if there's anything that we can learn um, about how we share our ideas or how people listen to ideas. Um, because in a way, it shouldn't have been that hard, should it? Yeah, it was, it was seven years, actually. Was it? <laughs> seven years, and actually I was speaking to amazing lightning designer Bruno Poet this week, and he said, so you just talked it into existence? And I said, yeah, that's what I do. You talk it, you, um, you transfer the image, and you tell people it's important until it sticks. Mm. And um, people are on the edges of it, and you kind of, it's kind of producer blagging, isn't it? Where you say, oh, so and so. But it, it, it's, con, con, it, yeah, it's, it's conjuring ideas. And I think that's mm. what, what artists are brilliant at doing. But um, that one was an extremely big and un, untested idea, which is why research and development is so important, actually. Brilliant. Yes. Thank you. Um, Vanessa, I want to come to you on that because the rest of us all work in organizations one sort or another where there are all of these metrics people asking you know who's it for what do you want to do with the audience? <coughs> what do you want the outcome to be you're a poet mm. um and you're you don't ask people what they want before you write a poem but i, I work to commission a lot so i i'm still beholden to things that are coming from an external um, prompt. Uh, so I've, I've learned a lot about working with the, the, the desires of a community or, a, or an organization. Um, and there's a, beautiful, there's a beautiful symbiosis that has to happen because they're asking me because there's something they like about the specific way I work and write and perform. But I'm also, you know, I, I'm not there to serve my vision, my ideas, my, you know, I've got my own practice to do that in. And, the idea in theory as a freelancer is that you hopefully make enough money from that sort of work that you can indulge your passions and the, the little poetry book you want to write or the little play that you want to produce. Um, or ideally have that commissioned by other people, but there is a beautiful model you can have whereby you get enough money from these types of briefs to then make these things without the pressure of an arts council bid or a commission from a, a theatre or an institution, which comes with its own pressures. So I don't want to give the impression that I, I get up every day and make what I want and write what I want. I've, I've had to write some dross. <laughs> and that's fine because, um, you know, I, I talk to other artists and they say, oh, you know, it's so, you know, I don't, I don't want to pander to anybody. I don't care what the audience thinks. I don't care what this person thinks. You know, I make for me. I don't, under, I don't understand that. You know, I, I, when, I, when I create, I'm not trying to talk to myself. You know, there's always this notion, this belief, even before something leaves the realm of my bedroom or my head of, of a conversation happening and working to brief. And there's been very different experiences with that in terms of how much I've been, it, how much I've enjoyed making the work or been proud of the end result. But it has taught me about collaborative work, which is really, really important. You know, this idea of the, the indulgent um, self-aggrandizing artist, you know, it, it doesn't fit into the reality of, of, of doing this sustainably and it's a good thing even though sometimes you might huff and puff about it but um yeah it's um it's beautiful actually there's there's been so many times where I've said okay yes to this because it had the requisite amount of zeros in the email you know what I mean 
but then I met amazing people. Um, I learned, you know, like I did a commission for, um, you know, the National Congress of Libraries or whatever. And I got to learn about the history of libraries and, you know, the principle of, of, of what made, what's like a very socialist principle come to be something that we all are really behind. Even though if you tried to make libraries a thing now, there's no freaking way, right? They'd be like, what, books for free, computer access for free, who's gonna pay for that, right? But I, I would say that, you know, <laughs> Across political allegiance, I don't think there's anybody who would say that we should be getting rid of libraries, right? And, you know, I got to learn about the history of how that came about. The poem that I wrote, eh, four out of ten. But <laughs> someone paid not watching, it's okay. yeah, someone, <laughs> someone paid me to, to learn about that and, and, and engage with the people who have given their lives to library services. So, you know, I, I'm as much about the process of, of making and creating and the the things I get to learn and the people I get to meet as I am the, the product. Um, so yeah, I would argue that I imagine those seven years were horrendous of, you know, feeling like you were coming up against those ceilings, but in hindsight, do you go, oh, you know, the people I met or, you know, if I, if someone had said yes straight away, maybe that person wasn't the right person. And, you know, all of that the circuitous process made everything fall in place in a way that is actually very beautiful and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm a bit hippie like that. I kind of believe in these things. I think everything happens when it's meant to. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not floating on the wind doing what I want all the time. And I don't think I'd want to either, actually. Great. Angie, I don't know whether you want to answer that. <laughs> That's <laughs> no. a bit raw. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but... I, I, I'm, I'm totally... Um, um, no, it, it's just a thing about trust. But, um, you know, it's interesting because at that time, you know, there's people in power and they they just don't trust you and they can't you can kind of see them sneering and mm. laughing and going you're never going to make that happen or that idea needs work and there was one artistic director who said to me that that idea just needs a bit of work and then this after doing my first and second album uh came and said what's your next idea and I said well I'm not sure it's something about plants and oh it sounds great we'd love to commission it so <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's it is about trust and I think when you can see <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's just a bit, it's a bit irritating, isn't it? But I, it, there is something beautiful about slow work, and I think it is richer for being slow. And I, I'll probably miss that now that work's getting yeah. faster paced. And, you know, if that person who shunned the idea had said yes, the initial feeling might have been like, yes, I've got the funding, I've got the support. And then they would have been coming in with, yeah, but can you do this? And can you change that? And can you, eh, eh. do you know what I mean? And it sounds like what the project ended up being was exactly what you envisioned. And it was this beautiful communal um experience rather than working with someone that's like yeah we want this but we we you know we want to like have it sponsored by red bull or some shit do you know what i mean i don't know people do crazy things um <laughs> um so yeah i think uh it's it's yeah it's of course devastating to not have um the things you believe in um supported um but every time i've had that experience where i'm like oh it should have been at that juncture or it should have been with this person with the, you know, the beautiful little look into the rear view of hindsight, it's like, eh, no, that panned out how it was meant to, in my experience anyway. Thank you. Um, Shami, I just want to pick up on what Vanessa was talking about in terms of the, the, the kind of engagement on that library project. Move slightly sideways, but to ask you to talk a bit about the show yeah. you've just presented at the gate, um, which is a very sort of politically resonant so, so I, I, um, I really resonate with both sides of this conversation and um, the bit of this conversation that is about we are not an island, we live with other people, we engage and of course it matters when someone wants to commission and somebody resonates with the story but, but equally that precious part of the individual which is I, I, I need to create whether they like me or not whether they persecute me or not. And this part of the artistic experience is actually a reflection of the human experience, isn't it? And never more so than in the case of refugees. Um, and in the post-war world, there was no more important part of the human rights framework than the Refugee Convention. And it's been dishonored by all sorts of governments, including various British governments and and I'm very proud of the fact that the the most recent production at, at the gates 
the gay in London. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, it was in Edinburgh and it's been in Kent, it's been other places, was a play that was notionally about the hostile environment, which sounds like really boring and gritty and but actually because of the magic of theatre and, and in this case magical realism it was able to tell that the story of that experience in a different way and and that's what creative communities can do in a way that lawyers and politicians and activists and journalists even can't do in the same way so when people have been so dehumanized what magic to, to, to rehumanize those people and their stories. And we are living in this biggest refugee crisis. I don't need to tell you that since World War II. And people are not even humans anymore. Their numbers and their you know, terrible political rhetoric. And this wonderful play, um, you know, Sami Ibrahim's play, um, that we put on in this too woke, too North London theatre, but nonetheless, I'm so proud of it because it told the story of the migrant experience, not in a political way, but just in a human way that I think connected with people and with complexity. By the way, I, I do understand that sometimes I have to be tub thumping. Sometimes I have to go and fight for a cause but what you guys all do in the arts and particularly in theatre, but not just in theatre, is that you can you can tell a story with sensitivity and complexity. And even I don't want to give this play away because it's so beautiful and I am so proud of it. But even in this. This story, this refugee story, because that's what a sudden violent burst of rain is, there is complexity about how one might react or not react in that, in that situation. And that is the human part. And no press, press release and no political speech and no piece of legislation will ever be able to compete with that in its, in its possibility of connecting with people who would not otherwise be, wouldn't be connected with. Because nobody's a refugee until it's too late, right? We talked about Ukraine. I bet there were people in Ukraine that never thought that they would have to be in a refugee scheme coming to the UK. Mm -hmm. And so it goes on. It's, it's only when it's too late. And the beauty of the arts, and I would say theatre in particular, but other arts, is that what if we could empathise before it's too late? What if, because of these stories, I don't care if you're telling your stories through poetry or theatre, or music or cinema, or what if we could empathize before it's too late? And, um, and so, so that's when, yes, I'm proud of the gate and I'm tub thumping for the gate, but I'm really tub thumping for all of you in this creative community, which will transcend politics. This government, whoever you vote for, the government gets in. And refugees are always the most vulnerable people. And it goes like this and it goes like that. But what if we could humanize the dehumanize? And that's what that's what you do. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I want to move on to this is a very broad question, but take it in any way you want, anyone. Um, what is it, given all of this really inspiring energy that you've been showing in this conversation so far? What is it that we can or need to do differently in order to release that, in order to release from where we are now, it might be what can the Arts Council do differently, it might be what can government do differently, or it might be what can we do differently, or it might be what can we ask people who aren't asked to do differently. What should we actually do in order to move forward? Because there's a weird combination of struggle and vision in this conversation. Who wants to talk about that? Can I, can I leap in? Yeah. I just got to... I'm, I'm, I'm with you, I'm a your wingman, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and every, just leap in and interrupt and interject and, and vehemently disagree um, if you feel like it. Um, 
it sounds so simple, but I, I don't really see how we start to really create a world where art is something that everybody, no matter you know, what family they're born into, what school um, they happen mm -hmm. to find themselves in, um, whatever strata of society they occupy, we need to bring it back into schools. And what, what really made me realize this is when I put the poem about Colston online, and I, you know, I had no idea what it was gonna do or what traction it was gonna gain, but because it's used so much in schools now, and teachers say to me all the time, oh, you know, the kids love it. And, you know, they're really engaged with poetry and they're telling me, oh, like I thought poetry was rubbish, but you know, they watch this and they think it's kind of cool. And, you know, kids write their own reaction poems to it and whatever else. And that is such a contrast to the general attitude that I hear from people across the age spectrum. You know, people will see me and my fellow poets do a gig and they come up afterwards and they go, oh, I, I, I thought I hated poetry or I'd never really, oh, you know, ever since school and having to underline assonance on a Keats poem or some shit, I've never engaged with it since. Or, you know, oh my God, I have to do a best man speech, panic, panic, look up some wedding poem um, <laughs> on Google. That is as, as far as most people's engagement with poetry goes. Um, that's not because poems are shit. That's because most English teachers are terrified of poetry. They themselves weren't taught it in a way that was engaging, rigorous, cheeky, playful. You know, we're, we're, we're getting people to engage with the arts, if they get to engage with the arts at all in school, um, academically before they're engaging with their, with, with their chest. Like, how does this make you feel? Do you like it? Do you not? You know, you, you are not subservient to the, to the painting or the poem or the film. Like it belongs to you, you know, once that person put it in the public domain, it belongs to you, right? And people are so scared. What do you think of this painting? I don't know, what did they mean by it? What do you think of this poem? I don't know. I, I think I'm supposed to underline it. I don't think well, how I feel about it matters. Of course it fucking, it's the only fucking thing that matters. If we, don't, if we don't inculcate that at a young age, we don't create people that want to spend 20, 30 quid on a theater ticket, even if they can afford it, right? Um, we don't we don't create a culture whereby people are like oh like drama school is cool mm -hmm. like I'm gonna I'm gonna go engage with that um, so for me seeing the power of having that and we and we had that we had that for a hot minute and now it's going it is going you know like the the, the schools that I get to go to to run workshops are the the posh schools that have loads of money or you know occasionally a school might scrimp and scrape and you know get their pupil premium together but then they have to put 60 kids in the assembly hall for me to run a workshop with them like it's like how is this going to work right so that to me is so important that people are engaging with the arts in a way that makes them feel like they actually have a stake in it from a very young age you know across across the board um because you know proximity is everything some people are lucky to be born into a family where they have proximity to culture and it shouldn't it shouldn't it shouldn't come to that you should be able to walk into school and oh you can learn piano you can mm -hmm. um you know go to, to to poetry club and like write your own poems and um you know argue with this keats poem because you don't fucking agree with what he says about this or that you know just 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 a sense that you know you 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 don't stand on ceremony in a, you know in, a, in an art environment mm. or in front of a piece of art um which is hilarious because I'm all for like everybody should come to the theater you know like break the break the windows open but then I have I have absorbed the the culture right so when I hear someone whispering yeah. or like crunching crisps I'm like this is the theater <laughs> but right do you know what I mean like we, like we need to we again yeah. it's about re me rescinding my conditioning mm. and my sense of superiority and say so if I really mean it about this shit being inclusive you know, I might yeah. have to accept that people are going to crunch crisps in the theatre. <sighs> um, <Yeah. laughs> but you know, if, 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 if that is the exchange for this being a space that not just, you know, the, mm -hmm. the rich and white are comfortable in being, so be it, man. Let's, let's go. So anyway, that was... Chris for everybody. Chris for... Not every... No. <laughs> <laughs> we have to take it in shifts, innit? Yeah. <laughs> no more than 5% of the audience crunching crisps at any given time. And Angie's coming in with a, uh, a change idea. I, yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying. I also think that we just need to be more horrified with what the current government are doing and how the arm's length has turned into, you know, pretty much the hands are in the, yeah. in the pot and swirling things around. And, you know, George Osborne is the chair of the British Museum. He's changed how the British Museum were going to react after BLM and look at the British story differently. And he's now put hold on that and he's gonna tell the 
you know, there's no colonialism story that's very convenient. That's happening everywhere. There's Tories who are now heads of national science institutions deciding where our science funding is going. The experts in the field are not part of what's happening next. And um, I, you know, the Pollinations Project that I told you about was a commission that was part of what people used to call the Brexit Festival. And I had to make a difficult decision about whether to go for it. And boycott it and put some narratives that I think need to be told in the British arena or, or boycott it and hide and hide under a rock. And I respect everyone's decision of what, what they did around that commission. But for me, I'm like in it to win it. I'm in it to change it. And, you know, that's why, you know, I'm on the board of the Arts Council London. And that was a horrific process. And I, you know, I feel the pain. And that was a directive. And but if we don't sit at the table, we're not going to change things. Great. Alan? Uh, I, I've, I'm, I've, I have some, I've some policies. I'm going to pretend I'm emperor for a bit. Yeah. Maybe just five <laughs> minutes. Chris, for everyone, for a start. Uh, we've got to stop the charitable statuses of public schools. The reason why we've got to do this is because they're not charities. Yep. Just stop yeah. pretending they are. And, and they take money out of the system. So one of two things is going to happen. Either all the public schools are going to fall over because the, the, the tax cuts, uh, the tax benefits they get from the charities. Uh, OK, fine. Well, then, you know, that's great. We're going to flood all of a sudden. Uh, loads of children are going to flood into the system. All those children are going to have <laughs> parents who give a shit and I want to uh, want to invest money. So I think that's going to be a benefit. And if it doesn't, it's OK, because we're going to have some tax money to do all the things we should definitely do for the schools. Um, I also think everyone who gets Arts Council funding, if they're an artist, they should be a governor of a school. But that's a bit fascist, and I'll do that another day. <laughs> Secondly, we spend £500 million pounds worth of arts funding on, in this country for everyone to have the best cultural life possible. And whatever your opinion of the Arts Council, and they're easy to smack, and also their face is so easy to smack, uh, we know it's not happening. So we've got to do something about that. Um, and what we're going to do is move beyond the market. We cannot use this money anymore for pump priming. There are too many organizations out there giving two million pounds to go into the marketplace to find four million pounds to keep it open. I absolutely understand that that is a business model that has been given yeah. to these organizations. I absolutely understand the argument. And I also have never met anyone who didn't work hard and wasn't brilliant that run organizations like this one and all the other ones that I work for. Thanks very much. I'm available for commissions. However, if we are not radical in how we spend our arts funding, they're going to take it off us. And they're not going to take it off us because of the Tories or because of Labour of any type. They're going to take it over because when you go into a place like Holbeck and you all have your own Holbecks and you explain what arts funding is, they think you're fucking mad. They're like, what? I pay this and I still have to pay £30 a ticket for, to see a play? And they're like, actually, when you think about it, £30 is very reasonable. And they're like, are you high, kid? £30 is not very reasonable. It absolutely is when you're sat on the other side of the table. The argument, we are losing it and we have to take it back. We take it back by making a fucking dragonfly. That's how we take it back. We take it back by telling stories so amazing they will remember them for the rest of uh, their lives. And the third is, is cultural democracy. We, we, not all chairs are as good as Shannon. Our arts organisations are run by boards. In Britain, <laughs> the only things that absolutely don't matter or things that are crucially important are things you're not paid for. And we don't pay our boards. They're people who mostly, with a few great exceptions, have already done really well out of the system. And we go to them and say, our country's on fire. We need visionary leaders and we need a, a new way of being. Can you help? And they're like, yeah, but when you think about it, actually, some of what we've got is great. We need a different <laughs> way of governing everything. We hate our politicians, we hate our local councillors, we hate the people who work for the council because people are too removed from those decisions. I have managed a working men's club, which is members owned for the last four years. And it's the reason why I will die 10 years older. And I'm about to leave that working men's club because I have failed to convince them of many things. I've failed to be a good enough storyteller. However, that is their responsibility. The distance between them and the decision they make is so close and I cannot pretend to make that for them. And we need that in more of our, our civic society. We need people to be empowered. We need communities to feel genuinely like they're empowered as opposed to come to the meeting, then fill in this form, yeah. then do this, and then you can have real power. And if we don't take these, if we don't make these changes, I promise you they will just simply disengage. And when they disengage, they start to hate. People start to hate. And when they start to hate, we come along and go, no, no, wait, we got to put on a play, stop. Ah, it's too late. We do it now. We're radical. And the whole point of theatre artists is to imagine different ways of being. That's what a rehearsal room is. That's what a stage is. And we are too often failing to do it. We need courage. We need a tiny bit of recklessness as well. Excellent. Um, Shami, but... How do, how do I follow I that? Know, I, I just... <laughs> other than with 
total admiration and a reminder of why I'm here and why it's so wonderful to be in a creative space and not in an overtly political space, even though there's nothing that isn't political and there's nothing that isn't hopefully creative. Um, I just want to, to, to thank you, Tom, and, and, and thank colleagues for, you know, for letting me share in, share in this experience and give me a little bit of hope. Because sometimes when you're in London and, <laughs> and, not, and not even in North London, but in SW1, which is where the Palace of Westminster is, you, you feel very sad and you feel very, very depressed. And you feel that our conversations, whether about leveling up or are really patronizing, really patronizing and stereotyping as if, as if working people and white people or black people or poor people or middle class people with a conscience don't care for each other and don't care for the stories that are about caring for each other. Mm. And so this is why this is a shot in the this is a shot in the arm for me. And if it's a shot in the arm for me, it's been a shot in the arm for me since I was a kid. And I want other kids mm. to have that opportunity for that shot in the and I think that's what I've taken away from all of this. I mean Look, I'm not, you are artists, many of you in this room, certainly on the stage, I'm not an artist. I'm just someone who had the benefit of trips to the theatre and violin lessons. I was never going to be an artist. I ended up, whatever it was I ended up as. But I have benefited so much in my life from that insight and that education and that ability to connect with other humans that comes from the creative sector and I want that to sustain because the people who don't want that to sustain what is what in the mines or in the mills or in the trenches and not caring for each other and not thinking for ourselves and that cannot happen right that cannot, cannot happen we can disagree we can love each other's creative work or hate it or react to it and but we will do it in the way that we've been doing it in this space tonight and not in the way that would otherwise happen, which is bad, which is polarized, which is nasty, which is ultimately violent. And that is why I believe in the creative sector. I believe in the theater. I believe in poetry. And I, I'm just so privileged actually to, and, and thank you because it's like, group therapy for me <laughs> <laughs> and I bloody well needed it <laughs> so thank you Tom and thank you thanks all of you thank you um, this is a good moment to open the conversation out to anyone with a question um, you can do that if you're at home as well by writing a question into the webinar chat um, and if you um, if you are at home or even if you're here the poem that Vanessa was talking about is called hollow uh, Google it if you haven't come across it already. And Alan's book, um, <laughs> reading Alan's book is a bit like listening to him speaking. I can tell you, it's literally a book that sort of hits you over the head with charm and brilliance. Oh, and um, when you're trying to go to sleep, um, it's on sale here and you can get it online as well. Um, who's got a question or a thought? It can even be. Um, I'm not uh, storming off, I'm just going to get some wine. Right, some wine for yeah. Vanessa, please. The best, by the way, are questions that aren't really questions, okay. cool. you know, like <laughs> comments that are pretending to be questions, like blah, 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 don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> we love those. <laughs> and if you're more subtle or French or Australian, just say <laughs> blah, 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 and then raise your voice at the end of the sentence. <laughs> yeah? Right, go for it. there you go, there's yeah, one. Yeah, here we go. I think you've got to wait for the mic, dude. Yeah, there's a mic coming. It's right, it's and coming your way. We're working out. And say, say, say who you are if you want to, but you don't have to. My name is Luke. Uh, hello. My name is Luke. <laughs> and I've been an alcoholic for 12 years. No. Um, thank you again for the... the you might be Australian as well, actually. No, I'm from South Devon, but thank you. Oh. <laughs> Everyone likes an Australian. Um, I just wondered, because what you seem to have been focusing on for the, for the majority of this talk has been what some people might high culture poetry theater i think most people no i no, i'm, I'm, I'm I, not I'm using it for that. I, i'm not i'm not doing that but i just mean <laughs> most people 
do engage in culture, whether they do that through mm -hmm. binging Netflix series, through playing mm -hmm. Call of Duty Modern Warfare or Dota, mm -hmm. whether it's through team sports, all these sorts of all these sorts of things. Um, what's so special about the kind of arts that the Out Arts Council are funding uh, that doesn't get delivered by these other forms of cultural engagement that almost everyone gets to participate in, at least in, this, in a country like this where we're very, very lucky? I'm actually going to do something slightly weird, which is invite someone from the floor to answer that question. Anyone want to answer that question from the floor? The question is, uh, what's so special what about the kind of culture? Yeah, uh, say, uh, theatre, poetry, the kinds of things which receive Arts Council funding, those kind of performances and installations from the kind of what you could call popular culture of video games, Netflix, the kind of things that I think Tom, most people Tom, you've got to let me at that. Okay, I'm going to let quick, Just quick, that. and then you guys jump in. Yeah. Agree, disagree. Let's make it spicy. But <laughs> there's, two, there's two big things. One, the, the big issue is this idea of high culture and low culture. Mm. Like, that is, that is an invention, man. Like poetry, you know, if you look, if you look in West Africa and the griots, yeah, poetry was for the fucking people, right? It's only in the West post printing press that poetry became, you know, an ivory tower situation and thick, right? And people like me, you know, my, my whole USP is that like, that is not how I consider poetry. That's not the, the poetry environment that I came up in, right? So there's that. I, I, I want to live in a world where you, you're just as much likely to go to theater as you are to play Call of Duty, right? And the, the distinction is, is that because those things are much bigger commodities, there's a lot more money in them, commercial money. So that's the distinction, not that um, there's any difference in them because there's, there's, there's video games that are very sort of strange, experimental, you know, you would put them in the high culture category if we want to use these categories. Um, and then there's also, you know, West End theater, which is, you know, people who don't make that much money will still go and pay 60 quid per ticket to go to the theatre once a year, right? So I don't think it's about money or class necessarily. I think it's about how we teach people to think about what, what art is for them and what is not, which I have a oh, big oh, issue with. But everyone, go, go, go. Wait go. a minute, Shami wanted to come in. Everyone probably wants to yeah, come in. Yeah, but somebody from the audience wants to oh, come good. in first. Go on. No, go on. No, no, mate, it's, we're, this is a democracy. And it doesn't feel like <laughs> a <bit. laughs> I'm really sorry, Alan. You've read my book, so you can just block your ears. For it's a, it's bit. a great book. You should she should tell you the title and you should buy it when it's available. It's very good. Do you know where those terms come from, highbrow and lowbrow? No, no tell, tell, tell us. Okay, tell us. Go. Actual knowledge coming your way. The racist pseudoscience known as phrenology, which ding, was ding. the yeah. Victorian belief that it was possible to measure the shape of someone's character by measuring the shape of their skull. And you know how you were talking about the potential need to invite a more democratic mode of participation in terms of not necessarily demanding silent reverence anymore, because that doesn't suit everybody and every person. Well, that idea of silent reverence emerged at exactly the same time as that idea of high culture as producing good moral character. It was all part of the white supremacist, classist campaigns to culture and civilise people through culture by making them sit down and receive the benefits of high art. But there's loads of work now you might want to look up if you're interested. Um, there are, there's the widening participation research project, which is about understanding culture as more than just going to places like this and watching what Matthew Arnold called the best that has been thought or said in the world, and instead asking for whom the best is has been made, and also about democratizing the idea of cultural value. There's a whole big center for cultural value that's happening in Leeds. Mm. So there's lots of research that is working to understand culture as more than just that tiny slice of highbrow art, which is really great and really healthy. Can I, can I tell a quick story? Yes, because we're not having it that we're going to have actual facts with people who know things, Kirsty. I'm just going to chuck some shit now. I, I, I run the oldest working men's club in Britain, uh, and uh, it's programmed uh, often by the community. They get to, and the two most important, the two most popular things by country mile opera and drag queens. Um, by the country mile, they're like they outsell everything, and it's quite annoying because I'm in a sort of 
um, jihad with the local opera company, but it doesn't matter. They're just so popular. Um, I, I think it's about popular commercial yeah. versus subsidized and subsidy it provides the opportunity to create social glue mm -hmm. and commercialism provides the opportunity to collect data they might not be looking thinking about your mental health they might be putting you on a video game they might be doing all all the best things but it is um you know it's as popular as fish and chips whereas what the subsidized sector is trying to do is to find tentacles into new ground into new stories into untold work and into un um, unreached people and audiences and so that's the difference for me may i use a metaphor you may <laughs> may i use a sort of scientific metaphor in a cultural context check with finesse. so once upon a yeah. time yeah i mean the wheels fell off a little bit <laughs> yeah. on that second question yeah right? it okay. started to run away from that once, upon a time, once upon a time there was a pandemic and it was really deadly and a lot of people died and everyone wanted the vaccine right? And the vaccine came and the vaccine came from universities and from little, comp little companies that nobody had heard of. And when they came up with these big ideas, they were bought and, fun and the money for their big ideas came from governments and came from philanthropy. A little bit, bit like a, a lot of art. And the moment they came up with the vaccines, there were many of them, a few of them, then they got bought up by Big Pharma and everyone said, Big Pharma is good. And the market is everything. And everyone forgot that the investment in this research that was life-changing life research, not to save me, not to save you, but to save all of us, came from these people beavering away they weren't working in big pharma, they were working in universities and they're working in little companies and they were funded by philanthropy and the public sector. And when it became marketable, it was marketable and people bought it. And then they fought over the, the spoils and some people didn't get access to the vaccines because they were in the global south and they couldn't pay the price and they wouldn't share the recipe. And that's for another day. But what I will say is, I don't believe that rap is rap and poetry is poetry and that somebody's music is music because it's street music and someone else's music is classical. I don't buy that bullshit. I'm not prepared to say that Shakespeare's only for toffs and opera's only for toffs and poetry, you know, bullshit. There's lots of money in divide and rule. But what I believe in is humans and this experience that comes from this beautiful stuff that you all do. And I, I, I just, just don't believe the hype about, you know, good culture, bad culture, marketized culture, poor people's culture. You know, we have these yearnings and we have these contributions to make for each other. And when it becomes, when it goes down the line, then suddenly, the pop star is a movie star and the rap artist is a movie star and everyone's a movie star, but it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of work and a lot of investment, and a lot of nurturing before that happens. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on to someone else with a question, but uh, we'll come back to you if we get stuck. Yes, question down here. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, arts in a time people because I think art specifically theatre has kind of always been a time of crisis for the disabled theatre goers, theatre specifically. Um, around 20% of the UK population identify as disabled and an even higher percentage of that um, have access needs and might not necessarily identify as disabled. And I just wondered what, what can individual theatre makers, performers and also large organisations, what do you guys think that they could be doing to kind of tend to that in this time of crisis for everyone, how, because, you know, it's about funding, it's about money, it's about sales, you know, 20% of ticket sales are, you know, one argument is that they're lost because they, they can't access it. So what do you guys think that, that the arts and art makers could be doing to, to attend to that? You've got to treat it as a staple. So, you know, if, 
if you look at a normal theatre budget, you've got your creative fees, you've got your production budget, you've got your marketing budget, and you've got your access budget. And that absolutely needs to be there from the very beginning. Mm. And, um, and, and to work with, a, we've, we've been working with access consultants and it, is, it isn't the easiest way and to bring that lived experience in. And it, it, it costs money and it costs time, and it costs thought. And to recognise that from the off and to, 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 to keep up with that, I think is really important. But too little it's always too little too late often often and I think you're not ready to do a project unless you've got some of that provision in your budget mm. I'm seeing it being taught more and more in universities and training places I think it's one of those things that in 20 years time we'll look back and be like god can you imagine when that yeah. wasn't just part of our thinking so access riders for both the performers um, but also for audiences are now part of the kind of pack that a graduate company in their late 20s trying to bring their show to will will include and that wasn't true 20 years ago when i so i think it is one of those things i'm not suggesting for a second that it, it it's resolved but i think that we are moving forward and we're making it a core part of the creativity thinking rather than as, as andy says at the end going oh we didn't you go no actually how do we how do we do this from the very beginning mm. um, and that has definitely come on in the last few years there's miles to go but i'm that's one thing i am reasonably hopeful about i think and provision is a principle rather than you know if we're not seeing that you know you're filling that 20 percent i.e you know you've got your captions or you've got your interpreter but did anybody who was hard of hearing attend so you know you so you know you've you've spent 300 pounds having this interpreted and then nobody who needed that service attended it's like well we 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 have to address the gap of of not providing for so long that people yeah. have completely disengaged from the arts so we're not going to suddenly have that audience in for the first few times. So I think it's about really sticking to that as a value and knowing that, and you know, it's like, it's like any quote unquote hard to reach community that we might talk about in air quotes, right? Um, and we think that just going, we've done this thing is enough. When actually you've got to build the trust, you've got to, you've got to be consistent. You don't take that thing away because well, we, 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 you know, we spent a few grand on this and people aren't biting. So we're cutting it again. And I know that's hard when, you know, budgets are being shrunk and shrunk and shrunk, but do you believe in it or not? You know, it really comes down to that. Principles are hard. Yeah, That's why exactly, they're principles. Exactly. Otherwise there'd be just shit we did easily. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. I'm going to throw in three questions that have come in from people at home. Thank you very much for submitting your questions. Um, and then we can pick up. One is a question about freelancers in the through the pandemic and as i said before freelance artists were really missed out mm -hmm. of the support from the government and the cultural recovery fund um the second is an intriguing question which is about um what possibilities does do we see does anyone see for arts organizations to work with relig religious and spiritual organizations and groups um in order to meet the real requirements of neighborhoods and hearts and souls not a question oh, I've, that's cool. I've heard before. And the third one is a question about Arts Council and, and, the, and the PERDA process, mm. which meant that uh, essentially Arts Council didn't engage with arts organisations in the run up to um, these funding decisions we're talking about. Um, so they were completely sprung on organisations. I'm uh, just to invite people to respond to that. Anyone want to pick one of those three? What was the freelance question? Was it's it? just to talk a bit about what we should be doing now, I guess, um, to support freelancers who haven't been supported. How should the government and foundations support freelance creatives, which make up 70% of the theatre workforce in the UK? Question from Cecile Bouvillard. That, I mean, freelance... Freelance workforce is a massive crisis. Mm. It's, you know, production staff have left the industry, producers left the industry, artists left the industry. Actors are still on £500 a week to go on tour, which has just never changed since for 20 years. Um, and it is, it is about time that we start changing that, that world and landscape. And, you know, there was some conversation a couple of years ago um, about an MPO for artists. I think the DYCP grant is some way a stepping stone in developing your creative practice grant by the Arts Council towards that. Um, and this move away from MPOs being created for smaller organisations and artists who don't, might not necessarily need a general manager. So I think mm. what we train people quite for all the time I've, uh, I've had a career in the arts is 
your holy grail is to get to an MPO. And to do that, you need to have a cash flow and a blah, blah, and a general manager and an accountant and all of these things that actually deviate your brain as an artist into business operation gear. And I wonder if there's a new way of working with the funding that we have from the Arts Council to engage artists and, and maybe the Cultural Recovery Fund. It was, you know, that it's a very limited pot and really that pot needs to be widened because that also hasn't changed for 20 years. So unless we can leverage um, money from the government, I don't, I, uh, I don't know. But do we, do we have any freelancers in the audience? Any, yeah. Um, it's, <sighs> listen, it's great. And I'm very lucky, I'm luckier than most, but you, you just don't know. It's like, this year's fine. I don't know about next year. Like, you, it's just, it's insane. And you know, like a lot of people in the pandemic all my work disappeared. Um, and I was lucky, I was eligible for the grant. A lot of people weren't, they, they fell through the crack, the many, many cracks that were in that grant. Um, I think there's a few things that might help. A union of some kind, which is hard because the nature of what we do is so disparate. You know, the way I work as a freelancer is not the same as you or anybody else. So it's hard for us to come together under an umbrella like people who are in, you know, sort of more um, standardized work. Um, but some sort of collective leverage might be a way to go. Um, talking to each other more. I feel like freelancers are often feeling very isolated. They're not really understanding what a standardized rate is, or they're not looking to their peers to support them in that way. So I'm very transparent. You know, I'm a big believer in like, everybody put your fucking fees on the, on the, on the wall. Like every, put your salary on the wall. Like we should all know what we're being paid. Anybody who wants to hide that, why do you want to hide that? Mm. what's that about you know so I you know my dms are always open I'm always saying to like fellow artists of mine like you know you want to know how much I would charge for this like let me know if you want support in knowing how to negotiate let me know so collect like a bit more of a collective leverage and also just um just community support you know like more of that mutual aid you know all of that all of that corny shit but we like we need that and yeah, we need support from the government. We need this, we need that. But like, I don't know, man. Fuck the government, low key. Like, we can't. Or I mean, Like, I just <laughs> listen. I can I cannot live and die by that. You know, they don't care about us. We have to. We have to take care of each other. That sounds really corny, but I I mean that in a very grounded, particular way. I'm not talking up in the air in the clouds. Like, you know, there's there's real structural ways in which we can mm -hmm. do that for each other. I think all that let's sorry. let's I want to invite you maybe to answer the question about spiritual and religious oh, organizations because okay. you were warming up when that came in. Yeah, I don't I like a Star good bit of self. When um, when COVID hit, all the arts organizations in my city closed and the vast majority of them never opened again uh, until until they were given lots of money. And I get that they're good people. I'm not I'm not dragging them a bit. I am dragging them a bit. <laughs> and we um we opened a food bank because um I thought if we left, I wouldn't be able to return because I see the people uh, who I serve, like literally face to face. And I was like, I'm not going to be able to come back. Mm. So we stayed and did a food bank and um, we had a big problem, which is, uh, which is we run out of vans really quickly. You, you only need three things for a food bank. Uh, you need lots, a big door and lots of floor space, vans and then food. And most of it's really easy, but we ran out of vans. So I rang all the arts organizations in Leeds and I said, you've all got vans sitting in your forecourts. I need your fucking vans. And every single one of them were like, of course, Al, we're with you, brother. And then they rang back at the end of the week and went, ah, it's a little bit more complicated, actually. It's a little bit, you are, you are, you are. And I'm like, no, come on, man, you're a fucking opera company and you'll never guess which one. Uh, come on, you've got three, <laughs> my next show's with them. I don't even know why I'm doing <laughs> uh, You've got three vans. And they said, it's, it, 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 it's the insurance. We can't <laughs> insure you to use them. Uh, I'll take care of the insurance. No, we can't let them go with the insurance. And oh, no. And our board won't let us do it because it's against our charitable aims. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> and then I rang the local church. And I said, I need a van. And they went, brilliant. You want to fetch it? Should we drop it off? Turns out they obviously used a different insurance policy. I don't know. Because <laughs> they wanted something different. Now, don't get me wrong. I like, I'm an Irish Catholic, so I could spend the next four hours talking about the problem of organized religion. And I'm not dismissing any of that. But what I love is groups of people who can get behind a story that becomes a mission. 
And I have found in my time, my gang, I'm one of four, we all get paid the average wage in the nation, we're all on buyouts, and so we have complete transparency for money as well. That's another way of trying to solve this problem. But I am all about finding a gang who go, we've got this problem, we've got coats that need to be delivered, we've got food that we've got fit that needs to be made. And then a group of people saying going, and I have found in my time that people of faith are quicker to that than artistic people mm -hmm. when they're operating within an organization. Human beings, human beings. I reach out to you as a human being, you're going to hold my hand. It, as an executive director of a building, it's more difficult. Of course it is. <laughs> but people of faith will go great. So I think that I am invested in my 20 minute town. I'm invested in my community. I serve them. I am their theater. Well, I am one, one quarter, there's four of us. And, and in that sense, I feel I have more in common with the local church than I do with Leeds Playhouse. Brilliant people, brilliant theater. They're all fantastic but they're not doing the same thing as me. So when we start to talk about arts funding or actually freelancers and artists and everything else, I'm like, I'm not in the game. The, the, the word theater has Andrew Lloyd Webber and me, and it's broad enough for both of us. That word might be too broad to be useful. So actually I find more affinity. Uh, we've just moved out of the world, oldest working men's club in Britain, full of asbestos and racists. And I've moved into the warehouse and it's owned by the local Buddhists because they want money. Buddhists love money, man, they really do, it's a surprise but they also understand <laughs> the health, the mental health, the holistic health, and therefore they find affinity with a theater company, especially one that's interested in giving everything away, than they do. I don't find that affinity with most other arts organizations. And so I'm, it really, fa comes with a health warning, obviously organized religion, very problematic. <laughs> don't let them anywhere near the schools. Brilliant, thank you very much. Does anyone want to respond to the Arts Council further <laughs> not telling us what was going on? Angie, I guess you were inside the castle. I was inside and outside, so we applied for MPO. And I yeah. think the reason that Perda happened this time so strongly was because of the historic, like, rumours that go around where someone's had a drink at the bar and decides with a company that they might get X amount of money or basically through casual networking that the MPO might be built rather than through the applications themselves. And so I was quite surprised as... Uh, diverse led organization coming to talk to Arts Council about our application and them going doors closed see you later because I felt a bit like this was the round where we're going to um, re-represent the nation through our portfolio yet this was the round where someone like me wasn't allowed to talk to Arts Council and shape the bid so I think there was a few flaws in that because it actually meant that you know potentially people who aren't in in the network um, were even you know left out in the cold um, when actually they they might have done with a bit more um support talking talking some of that through so I, and i think probably the inside the castle they probably felt the same way so you know i don't know what the perfect scenario is but i, I can see why it happened yep we there's a, a lot of discussion to be had on that thank you fern potter for raising the question um in a minute because i'm trying to run roughly to time mm -hmm. i'm going to come back to the panel and ask them to pick um, a work of art of some kind to mention or share with you that inspires or strengthens them. But while they're just thinking about that, um, yes, there's a question here. There's a microphone making its way. Has anyone else got an urgent there's question? There's Wave there's at question. me. So there's one at the back, the woman is about to okay, yeah, kick yeah, off. We'll come to you. So, well, if we have you ask your question, sir, yes, please. Um, so there's a lot being talked about uh, with grants and arts council and uh, the trust issue of how do you get through the door and the table of where I come from, I'm really North American. The, most of arts funding is not through grants; it is through philanthropy. Yeah. Oof. And I wonder how some of you see that, no. maybe not from single donors, but from community-based crowdfunding for philanthropy, mm. building up theaters for places that, you know, the internal drive to make mm. these theaters happen, because that doesn't disappear just because Arts Council stops funding things. People still want to see art, people still mm. want to make mm. theater, and they will make a space to perform mm. uh, and share uh, their stories. So how do you see that fixing it? Brilliant, thank you. Before we answer that, so question about philanthropy, pass the mic to the back. We'll have three questions. It's coming Was back. there another one here? Yes. Two minutes. Two minutes, we've got two minutes. We can do it. We're gonna, what happens if oh, we overrun? 
nothing. Nothing. Okay. Can we right. just deal with these questions and then come up very quickly? Go on. So, uh, yeah, I'll identify myself. Tom lives on air. Uh, uh, Linda Rock. But not everyone. Yeah, good. I'm based here in Bristol. Okay, so that lies that one out. Okay. <laughs> I was last week um, in uh, for an all party parliamentary group in Westminster. Ooh. And the Irish culture minister was there. Oh. And they were talking about the basic income for artists, which they've set up in Ireland. Yeah. This last month was the very first time payments went out. Mm. And it's going to be for three years, from 2022 to 2025. And there's going to be a, a, a control group of 1,000 people, another 1,000 who will receive this basic income. And I something, think it's something that should seriously, seriously be considered in this country as to allow artists, for whatever they do, to be able to actually put that into practice, yeah. rather than juggling four jobs, falling through the cracks during COVID, mm. is to actually have that yeah. support there. Yeah. And if they do make money on top of that, then they'll be paying their tax, won't they? Yeah. This is not like home money. Okay, thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much. One more question over here, then we'll try and answer them. Um, if you're uh, at home, pour yourself a drink. We'll try and get to the drinks here as soon as we can. Um, who's got a question there? Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Agnetha. Sorry if I get a little bit nervous, English is not my first language. Um, I, I just guess it's, it's a mix of a comment and a, and a question, because I think uh, one of the biggest crises currently is the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. Mm. And that has led me to look very much into um, ecological economy, which in brief is um, the notion of, like in mainstream economy, you want infinite growth, but ecological economy kind of mm. takes into account that that's not possible on a planet with finite resources. Yes. Mm -hmm. But one of the, like there are two fields, especially that can um, tap into like some sort of economy without using a lot of resources. And that's uh, care work and culture work. Mm. And I was wondering if that's something you think about because it's something I find quite inspiring. Yes. Mm. That's, yeah. Brilliant, thank you very much. So we've got a question about philanthropy a question about sustainability and a question about the uh, all, basic wage for artists. No. They're, they're all. Do you want to do no, them no, all no, at no, once? No, sorry. Go on. What? Go on. No, so, go on. Don't, no. don't boo. Crack on. No, no, no. Go ahead. Shami, you go first. Go and we'll come to Anna. Yeah. No, no. He he wants to go. He does want to go. Go uh, on. So 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 uh, the Irish don't thing. Do all absolutely. Of them, we were talking about it. Um, <laughs> uh, in Brazil, they do a thing where they do that, but you were also uh, given a ward. Uh, you're literally given an area. So if you're a sculpture, you go to that ward and then next door there's a band and the poet over there. And, and that leads to this point here, which is we've got to go back to this 20 minute town thing. We've got to, we've got to stop this thing. We, 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 um, uh, an opera company can't service the whole of Manchester. That's mad. Each community needs a way for art and they'll swap. Um, and, and then that leads to your point. That, that, that model exists in this country and it's working men's clubs, it's social clubs. It's, and and they're, they're being... Uh, community centers. Yeah, and they're falling yeah. apart. They're absolutely decimated and they're falling apart because we're not telling the story about them well enough. So we think the only way to go is the Arts Council and the only way to go is this. And actually those three things together, they're about wards, they're about villages and cities holding on to their artists, holding on to their places and making sure that they're responsible to, to build, but it's radical. It's, we're arguing here about whether this company got this and that company, it's, it, it's fine, but it's pissing about as the whole boat hits an iceberg. And we need a radical thought. It's all three of those things together. Go on. Shami. Oh, look, we need a mixed economy in, in the arts, like we need a mixed economy in, in everything else. Um, um, and I want to be positive and optimistic, and I always try to be, but we are social creatures and we are in society and we, do pay, we all pay taxes. And we, and the poorer people who work actually pay more taxes than Elon Musk into the proportion of what they take out of the world and what they take out of the economy. So I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do everything that Alan is, of course we should. We should all get energized. We should be in communities. And, and by the way, there should be philanthropy and all of these things, but the state needs to invest in infrastructure. And infrastructure isn't just digging holes in the road. Infrastructure is people too. It's social infrastructure and it's cultural infrastructure too. And I don't want the arts to be totally state funded because that would leave us very vulnerable to censorship, to oppression, to control. Um, I, I, I want a mixed economy in the arts as I do in everything else, but 
and I want to be all positive and energised and working men's clubs, but I want us to be clear about the kind of society we want to live in. Just to follow on, if I may, from the point that Vanessa made about trade unions, mm. I think it was a very powerful point. And freelancers can be in trade unions too. Mm. It, um, actors and musicians in this country have always been in, in unions. And there are people all, have, some of the biggest unions in the global South are actually people who are notionally freelancers. In the end, if you want to change things, you have to come together. Mm. And individual artists, contribute to the conversation every time they put something out in the world but if you want to take care of your terms and conditions and you want to invest in social infrastructure and cultural infrastructure you have to come together and that does involve organizing and sorry for taking that time and i'll shut up now um beautiful to, to the climate thing um i'm i'm very much a baby in thinking about what this means as far as the theater we make but i was really interested and inspired by a show i saw recently an adaptation of a book called Little Scratch. I don't know if I don't know if you know the name of the director. I don't know if you heard of this production. Um, her name escapes me now, but um, she only works with sets that have been entirely recycled, um, which is um, mm. easy to do on the sort of small scale that she works. Um, she has a lot of black box theatre, um, but it, it got me thinking about you know the potential wastefulness of you know these. The, the sort of shows I love, you know, your high production shit, you know, you're very, you know, multiple costume changes and the wah, wah, you know, I love that stuff. Um, and I'm not saying that that's equivalent to, you know, the oil industry or anything of that scale, but certainly we all have our part to play. And I believe that creativity comes from constraint. I think we make really exciting things when we don't have all the money at our disposal or all the resources at our disposal, right? When we're, when we're told, okay, well, you know, we're going to try and only work with um, recycled materials or, you know, we've, we've only got you know, materials within um, what's made in our city or our country to work with. I think we make more interesting and exciting things and we make more divergent and exciting choices. So I think rather than thinking of it as this worthy ecological choice, mm. which it is, but I think sometimes we have to trick our brains into seeing it as something else so that it's exciting and invigorating. Mm. So we go, oh, if this is a creative endeavor to know that we have to work within this parameter of like, you know, only recycled sets or only recycled materials. So seeing that show was, and it was, a, it was a beautiful show. It didn't feel like it was any less because of that choice. So that was really cool for me to see. Brilliant. There is lots, lots more we could be talking about, but I'm now gonna to come to the panel to ask you to talk about very briefly an artwork that nourishes. Have you got one, Angie, worked out? Uh, yeah. Do you wanna tell people about it? This is a food for the soul? Um, I experienced an artwork that was for the passengers of their prams and the people who pushed them. Mm. And um, it was a really beautiful piece. And it, I think it made you, you know, glance at the person with your fellow, your fellow pram pusher and their, and their occupant. Because often when you're, if you're a pram pusher, it's quite stressful and your occupants <laughs> might be crying and you might forget that they're there. <laughs> and, um, and, you, and you got to hear them appreciate you and you appreciate them and um, to be in a beautiful space together and to appreciate the other pram pushers in your, in your life and society. Brilliant. Thank you. Alan, what have you got? There's a brilliant theatre company in, in, in Hull called uh, Middle Child and they make something called gig yeah. theatre. I don't really understand the difference between gig theatre and musicals where you just stand up, but they do. And they rang to tell me about their new show, which is based on a, on a, on a painting that was made by a, a a woman called Elizabeth Thompson, and it's called The Roll Call. And she was the first woman ever to be um, sh showed at the Royal Gallery. Uh, and it was extraordinary, this first woman. And then, and then she was used as, this woman was used as this pioneer. And then, that, uh, but it was the excuse. They didn't have another woman for fucking years. The Royal Academy, sorry, not the Royal Gallery. And, and the, but the painting is of some soldiers in the Crimean War. And it's the first time soldiers are really painted, not as brave, but as knackered. They stood there and they're beaten. And there's a series, that, that, that little story is a series of little stories that are important that have been forgotten. The, the men that were painted, this woman who was a pioneer and then used as a kind of fig leaf. And then there's this little theatre company in Middle Child who are like, we're going to tell that story and go around the country. And the hope in that, the hope that there is a bloke like I'm really proud of in that painting and then it's forgotten for 150 years and we're all sat there now and then you're all going to look in your phone and look at it and you'll see that man's face and be like, oh yeah, that brings me real hope. Brilliant. Vanessa, what have you got? Concision, concision, concision. Right. Poet called Lisa Lux. 
uh, British Syrian. She's currently in Lebanon. Uh, there was a blast in Lebanon in 2020. Um, in the midst of that, she had approached a collection that her um, publishers were banging on her door for. She was late with it, but she has family in Beirut and she couldn't even conceive of the idea that poetry could fucking matter in the midst of what was going on with the people that she knew and loved on the ground. So one of the families she went to visit while she was out there doing a lot of activism um, was a refugee family um, and they invited her around. She brought a bag of rice. She talks a lot about how a bag of rice is one of the most important things you could give anyone in a crisis, water and a bag of rice. Um, and they asked her what she does. And she felt very embarrassed to say, I'm a poet, like, you know, cringe. Even I cringe. And in that context, I can imagine how excruciating that is to say. And they said, oh, do you have a poem for us? And she talked about feeling so bereft that she did not have a poem that could sit beside the rice. So she has dedicated her writing practice to writing rice poems, what she calls rice poems. So poems that are practical, poems that you can offer to people in moments of crisis, not in a platitudinous, like treacly way, but literally poems that, that, that speak to people's souls and guts and say, you know, this is in solidarity. Um, mm. And yeah, I love that. I love that she is trying to inject that back into poetry because it was there and then I think we lost it because we got caught up in it being high culture um, and running around on the moors and shit. And that's fine. Um, <laughs> but you know, tough times call for tough poets and she's writing those. So Lisa Lux, yeah. check her out. She's great. Brilliant, brilliant. thank you. Shami. So you? not for the first time this evening, it's my privilege to follow Vanessa. Um, and um, I wanted to uh, share my favorite poem by Lem Sisse, who I think is, um, pretty much one of our greatest living poets, certainly in the English language. Um, and, and this is my favorite of his. I have many favorites, this is my favorite favorite of, of Lem's and it's called Let There Be Peace. Let there be peace. So frowns fly away like albatross and ske skeletons foxtrot from cupboards. So war correspondents become travel show presenters and magpies bring back lost property, children, engagement rings, broken things, let there be peace. So storms can go out to sea to be angry and return to me calm. So the broken can rise up and dance in the hospitals. Let the aged Ethiopian man in the gray block of flats peer through his window and see Addis before him. So his thrilled, outstanding arms become frames for his dreams. Let there be peace. Let tears evaporate to form clouds, cleanse themselves and fall into reservoirs of drinking water. Let harsh memories burst into fireworks that melt in the dark pupils of a child's eyes and disappear like shoals of silver darting fish. And let the waves reach the shore with a That was beautiful. So thank you all for coming. Wait, wait, and wait, wait, wait. Did you say something? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you can do the next one. But hey, um, <laughs> thank you all for coming. Wild. Thank you for uh, watching and listening at home. Uh, thank you to the Genesis Foundation for inventing this format, hosting and supporting and selecting the panel and looking after us so well. But most importantly, thank you to Vanessa. Alan, Angie, and Shannon. <laughs>